one of these guys um, as the surprise winner. I mean, surprise, of course, because uh, Magnus Carlsen and Wesley Sell are the favorites right. by rating. Um, but I really like both of these guys. Of course, um, Maxime winning in the first round is huge. But can he get past his nemesis? Indeed. Hikaru was, for me, one of my three favorites. Uh, I had Magnus and Lavon as well in my favorites before round one. Uh, for Hikaru, it's a tough one. If he plays e4, he knows he's going to get a knight orf, which is an opening he plays himself. So it's not always that much fun playing against openings that you yourself uh, champion. So I'm not 100% sure about that one. I'm, I'm so far, um, Nakamura is MIA, but uh, the round is just starting right now, so um, he's probably going to be at the board any second. Not worry about it. And here is the aforementioned Hikaru Nakamura coming in now and getting blocked by Fabi's mom right there. <laughs> and Magnus' <is> dad. <laughs> The proud chess parents are, are in the crowd as well. Um, and Nakamura, let's see how this game goes. Well, this is the this was your prediction of a mainline knight orc with e4. Yeah, I noticed that Peter Spittler opened up with the English against uh, Vichy Anand. And there we have it. I think you're right. e2, e4. Well, it's 100% we're going to see Magnus c5. Game, Magnus decided not to test the e4 move. Oh. Play knight of three on move one. Other games against Maxime Bashir Legrave, he's played bishop g5 with success. Mm -hmm. um, and he, uh, in this game, chose h3. What do you make of the position that we have on the board now, Yasser? Well, it, it, h3 has always been what I considered a very positional approach uh, to uh, the knight orf, which, well, the spirit of the knight orf is so sharp that I always I thought of, it was a kind kind of uh, an easy, it, 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 it's not pressuring uh, black at all with this move h3, h3. Now, having said that, uh, these positions, they get some very sharp middle game uh, positions after moves like knight d5, knight d takes d5, e takes d5, and then white gets some play pressure on the queen side with a4 and so on. Now, here, I have a feeling um, that Hikaru is, is going to be doing something a little bit more special than just going for a positional approach. I suspect he's going to ha he's got something with F2, F4 prepared uh, on his mind. And I just don't know exactly how he's going to get the F4 break in. Should he do it right away, preface it with Bishop E3 first, followed by F4, or just play F4, castle short, and just go storming up the board on the king side. That's right. So those are kind of like the two ideas: Is occupying that, the d5 square and then also going for f4. Right. But we know for sure um, that when you see this move h3, it's very likely that we'll get a castles uh, castle short. But even when these two played in um, Norway um, with a, a similarly um, similar line that was similar opening, yeah. Yeah, bishop d3 on move six. Ah, yes, so, exactly. And, that was what I was trying to recall. Yes, bishop d3. And then e5, knight e2. And the difference, of course, was the bishop was already on uh, the d th This was the, the game, wasn't it? Right, that was yes. the game. And then after knight d2, bishop e7, um, castles short. And a knight did land on d5 a few moves later. I see. After castles, castles, knight g3, bishop e6, knight d5. And this gotcha. turned out to be a really wild struggle. Oh, my. All right. Well, we'll definitely keep fireworks. Uh, <laughs> I'll be expecting fireworks in that game. Uh, I wanted to go us, Maxime Vachier Lagrab playing against Hikaru Nakamura. This time, he's playing with the black pieces. Of course, we're used to seeing him on the black side of a Night Orf. But in this exact position, he had the white pieces against Vasilin Topolov in the London Chess Classic back in 2015. This is not a popular line, but he himself had it as white. And the game transpired exactly as we're following now. B5, knight d5 takes, and queen takes. Now, he had black in that game. He had white, excuse me. He had white in that game. And in this position, Topalo played the move rook to b8. This game went on, and Maxime was able to win the game uh, later, of course. But here, he decided he's not going to play Topalov's move, instead playing queen c7 wow. in this position. Queen c7, opting out of going for the rook move. Of course, the rook belongs more on c8 in the knight orf, not on b8. So this move 
looks a little tricky, but of course you cannot take on A8 because knight B6 and your queen's not going home. That's it. <laughs> so this position, clearly the rook is not on take. By playing queen C7, he gets to play bishop B7 on the next move, and be, then being able to put the rook on C8, this is his wrinkle. Now, this is not a novelty. It had been played once before, so he, as a knight or a specialist, he knows everything. He knows it all, and this line came as no surprise. Of course, he had it as white, and now he's playing it as black. This move, queen C7, an improvement, it looks like, over the rook B8 line, not misplacing the rook. And Nakamura now realizing that this is a nice little move, deep in thought, trying to figure out what to do about it. Thank you, Maurice. And we have our a special caller. That's right. We have a caller from Nigeria. He tried to reach us yesterday, and guess who it is? I'm going to go with MVL on this one. <laughs> So far we are following my game in London 2015 against Toparov. Because, uh, uh, yeah, just that game I thought Bishop G2 was actually in, in a great for white. And uh, Toparov, I think, played rook b8, but during the game I was wondering okay, what should I do after queen c7. I think, I mean, of course, uh, this is not considered it, but he preferred rook b8. B8 and uh, I mean he had some point because in the game his queen on d8 actually did some useful work on the king side but on the off chance that uh, Ikawu was prepared for that I decided to deviate and I mean I just want I mean of course uh, the rook is uh, uh, poisoned and uh, I just want bishop b7 rook c8 and it seems to me that should be at least playable game for both sides, so we'll see. But uh, yeah, I was a bit more concerned maybe about some of the lines. Well, an interesting confession to be sure, as he recalls exactly what the game that Mar Maurice had mm -hmm. cited, the Topolov game. At first, I must say that when I had uh, turned to the, the game, uh, I thought that something was wrong, that queen c7 was just blundering a rook. I hadn't uh, seen the move knight uh, b6, which begs the question. Again, um, Maxine is mentioning that this move had played against him, and he was wondering during the game what he had done about queen c7. Uh, one question you might ask is, uh, why not play knight b6? Uh, you defend the rook, uh, you attack the queen, and likely force the queen to drop back. And in this case, you would get maybe some kinds of positions that might look a little bit like this. I suspect that the Nidorf players really want this knight to be on the f6 square and the bishop on the b7 square. The bishop on the e6 square is um, tempting white into playing f4 and f5. So if we go to the game position, uh, what Maxime wants as a Nidorf player Bishop b7, knight on f6, rook on c8, and he says, I'm picture perfect. This is exactly what I'm playing for with uh, the knight orf, and I don't blame him one bit. I actually, I'm sure the positions even, maybe even the computers are saying white's a smidge better, but from a practical point of view, I, I know exactly what black mm -hmm. wants to do in this position, and I don't know what white wants to do. Maurice? I agree with that, and as a knight orf lawyer myself, Nine, my knight's not going to b6 unless you force me to put it on b6. We'll see that trend continue. Exactly. Um, as as Maxime's just played bishop b7 and rook c8, probably barely without looking. <laughs> <laughs> so we had left it after this uh, very nice move, queen c7 uh, move, uh, ignoring the threat to the rook, inviting white to trap his own queen by gobbling the rook. Queen takes a8 being met by knight b6, as mentioned. Bishop e3 now threatening the rook, bishop b7, giving the queen the boot, rook c8, very nice tempo, and now you're saying knight c3, and you're expecting bishop e7, or which move um, are you Actually, I think Jennifer? it looks like Maxime's just made the move knight b6. Knight b6, okay. So, just uh, so in this case, however, the knight is jumping to the c4 square because now that the knight is on c3, you... Maurice said, I don't like my knight on b6 when, when white can play b3. White can't play b3. Exactly. I like my knight on c4. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All specifics, and that one definitely is specific. The knight can get to c4. It looks 
comfy. What's black? What's white supposed to do here? I think um, white's going to take the knight. The knight has to die. And play. Yeah, and knight d5, and just you, 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 you play opposite color bishop position. You, you, you just kind of like go row row. I'm not playing for an edge. So you're saying that bishop takes b6 is uh, or it's less forced. Than it's forced. It's virtually forced. And now here, I'd probably be tempted to simply give up the pawn, because at the uh -huh. moment instead of pawn takes d5. Yeah, at the moment the bishop, you, you, you're two tempi, three tempi away from um, developing. I don't think you get to castle there, yes. Yeah, Pardon me. Uh, Queen a8 is also possible. Queen a8, queen d, yeah, queen a8 was a possibility. I just wanted to castle and basically say, I'm playing for equality. <laughs> I'm a bishop e7, rook c1, you know, I'll have opposite color bishops with, 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 with a great worse, queen on d5. On pawn, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm down a pawn, but I'm playing, I, I'm sitting there going, uh, uh, row, uh, I'm not happy about this move, knight b6. He's got to kill it. So yeah, it is. Uh, you cannot let this knight appear on c4. Absolutely, it's just going to be way too powerful. And right. and as you rightly pointed out, the b3 move is no longer possible. So you can get away with uh, with knight b6 and not have any worries for black at all. And uh, clearly, Naka doesn't, hasn't gotten much out of this opening. And you know, MVL is going to play with a lot of confidence. He's got a time on the clock. He's in this position. He's like, hey, I'm not supposed to lose this. I'm a knight of specialist. I don't lose these. Jennifer, yeah. let's try to roll the dice again yes. and take a phone caller. Um, Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Let us know your question and where you're calling from. And then I played some good tournaments. I also qualified for the... For exactly. That's what happens when you have a bishop that's no longer an F1, that, uh, that square is up for grabs. And, of course, MVL immediately um, recaptured. recaptured. And now it's uh, Nakamura on move, and the, the move uh, knight d5. Uh, I was actually going to ask uh, Yasser, so right. if you don't play knight d5 now, the, the trouble is the queen might come back to the c file, which will prevent you from playing knight d5 because c2 would be hanging. Right. And But what about, what if, like, after knight d5, we, we don't capture the knight right away? Um, say we play uh, queen c5. A very, very decent move, a very good question as well, I must say. Um, I'm not a big fan of a lot, I'm, I don't like to sacrifice pawns, I right. like to take them. Uh, I may feel obliged to play the move c2, c3. Here you could capture my knight, and again, I think that black's just doing quite okay uh, in these middle game positions were of opposite color bishops. In this particular case... So that's why case, you're going for the end game, because you think after pawn takes, you kind of like black? Oh, very much so, yes. The, F5, the natural yes. F5. Bishop yes. Uh, Not right away. Sometimes but, you yeah. even see uh, black doing such ideas as g6, bishop h6, f5. And for, for me, um, this is a septic bishop on G2, uh, Septilicus, we would call it in the Northwest. I'm just not very happy with the light square bishop, whereas I think black's dark square bishop has much more possibilities. You can imagine the bishop coming to C5. On so the other hand... That's why you instinctively just went for queen takes right away. Precisely. So at least in this uh, situation, I've got a nibble. The pawn on b5 is a little bit like a sore thumb, and you can easily imagine that white will angle for a2, a4, and maybe the bishop will actually come back. So there's something for white to say, okay, I can get an advantage uh, in this style of play. But yes, queen c5 is a definitely, the, you're under no obligation to capture the knight just because it showed up on the d5 square. As Feshnikov players like yourselves know, you can live with the knight on d5 for a while. For a while. <laughs> Not forever. Not forever. Um, more use and update on another game.
afraid again in another game and see the influence it had on this position. Knight B6 threatening to go to C4. That monster has to die because B3 is not playable. So he did take on B6. And after Queen takes on B6, he got ultra aggressive on the light squares. Remember, because of this trade, this knight and this bishop are the only two things, minor pieces on the board, that can get a grip on the light squares. The problem is that this bishop is pretty anemic. That's the main issue, is this piece has, would rather be on the B3 square. If you could pick it up, drop it over here, where it's influencing D5 and has room to breathe. But it doesn't have that in this position, so MVL said, so what? What do you have? Takes, takes, and he might play the move H4 and make this bishop even more anemic. So the move H4 himself, castles by both sides. And now the move rook to C4, preparing a move like B4 and also preparing just a double on the C line, more importantly, B3, a move you did not want to play if you're a white, because, of course, you weaken the C file where this pawn's already restraining your ability to push your C pawn. This is going to be problematic for Nakamura, rook back to C7, and now the move knight D1. So having to do some torturous maneuvers in order to deal with what's happening on the C file. Of course, if black plays this move, white will be able to play knight to E3, and he's not... Uh, he's not on the pressure on this line, but a move like B4 eventually, not now, and given the C4 square, but eventually B4 is going to put a clamp, a royal clamp, on that file, and this pawn is going to be backward forever. There's no way this is worse for black. Black is fine here, because bishop is the only piece that just needs a little bit of improvement. I imagine maybe G6 and bring the bishop on this diagonal is one plan, but black looks perfectly fine. He's got everything he wants out of a Nidorf. This should be okay for black. We'll see whether or not it's more than okay as the players continue in this critical round. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, speaking of more than okay, uh, I was actually thinking about black getting ultra aggressive in that game you were just pointing out after knight d1. Uh, instead of the move rook c8, uh, flickering through my mind was the pawn sacrifice d5, e takes d5, and bishop c5. Uh, as oh, that's a possibility, a yeah. Well, indeed, I'll just bring that up on my board uh, rank. That's okay with me. Uh, so uh, the flicker that went through my mind was something like d5 takes bishop c5. Okay, uh, unfortunately, it's a pawn sacrifice, but you can see the potential. Black gets in moves like b5, uh, b4, and bishop d4. Uh, that knight on d1 is really under the gun. F5, F4. I'm just saying it would have been. It's going. It would be a very intriguing way of uh, trying to take full advantage of White's position. Well, the important thing about moves <clears throat> like that is that even if they don't work, sometimes it's like a move later. Your opponent does something a little weird, especially at the and lower then level. Then it's perfect. Exactly. Then, then it's perfect, Maurice. And again, on the theme, this is a really important position. Uh, looking at it, queen to after knight d1, the immediate queen d4. Whenever somebody offers an exchange of queens, that means they're confident that their structure is better than yours. And any end game favors them. So this is a big move, a statement on MVL's part that, hey, black's doing well. I dare you to exchange queens in this position. Of course, a queen trade would relegate this knight to a totally passive existence, and the C-pawn is going to get hammered, if not just die in a couple of moves. So queen d4, powerful-looking move, at least in this position. The engines are saying, don't trade, run. <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> don't, you don't want to do that. Uh, defend your position and maybe get a tempo. But certainly black is playing forcefully. Nakamura did play the move queen a5, as a matter of fact. But it looks right. like black is lording over the chessboard at the moment, and Nakamura's going to have to be careful every single step from this moment forward. Thank you, Maurice. Yes, indeed. Uh, C2 pawn, E4 pawns are hanging in Hikara's position, and uh, MVL just uh, enjoying the moment because he definitely has uh, his opponent on the back foot. A nice initiative they're building. Uh, going to the game of Le yeah, Queen A5. So after Queen A5, um, yeah, the, the pawn being taboo is mentioned because of a quick knight e3 and knight f5 with an embarrassing fork. Okay. So instead we saw the queen c5 and now um, yeah, after g6 preventing the knight to come, to come into f5. Right. So we're caught up to the players now. You were just saying that the move uh, g6 uh, denying the knight the f5 square was displayed. And uh, Maurice was mentioning that uh, if there's one 
piece, Black would really like to improve, it would be his dark sword bishop. The move g6, uh, while it does prevent knight f5, also eyeballs an opportunity of playing bishop f8 to h6, forcing the knight on e3, which it is, uh, crucially, I might add, um, supporting the c2 pawn. So in this position, um, a, although with, with pieces getting reduced, let's say rook takes a8, bishop takes a8, rook over to a1, the rook could slide to a2, which would release the knight. Um, I prefer black's position, but it's going to be very hard uh, to turn this into something very clear. Although, again, I prefer black's position. Maurice? You know, it's interesting. All the games are proceeding so Yes, the second draw in a row for Hikaru, uh, this time with the white pieces against Maxim Vashilagrov. Hikaru, the opening just seemed a bit cagey. You started off in this very popular line of the knight off with h3, but it didn't seem like white got too much uh, from the start of the game. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, pr pretty boring. I mean, I think the, the hard part was whether Maxim should try and create something or not, but... Um, but, I mean, I think we both just played some normal moves, and then, um, then it was more or less just an even position. I don't think either one of us had, um, had any advantage, so it's, uh, I mean, pretty boring, but that's how it goes. Uh, you call it boring. Uh, I'm sure you wanted more with white. Uh, is, it, is it the preparation? The queen c7 move he played instead of rook b8, which he himself had white with against mm -hmm. Apollo. I'm sure you saw that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he just, uh, I mean, Maxim has played the Nidorf, uh I mean, pretty much his, his whole career, so he, he knows uh, a lot of a lot of the best lines. Um, and you can't you can't always uh, get something if your opponent is uh, super prepared. So, um, you know, I wanted more, but it's still uh, still only two rounds in, so a long way to go. Quick question on that score: How do you prepare for someone you know lives in this place? It's like this is his home. Uh, it's it's so hard because you know he's going to play it. He's not going to back down. Mm -hmm. Does that does that make it easier because you know what's coming, or does it make it hard because he knows it so well? I mean, I think it's a mix of both. I mean, um, I think uh, it's it's easier in a sense because you don't have to spend your time looking at a whole bunch of openings, but finding ideas is a uh, is a lot harder. So it's a bit of both. But um, but I mean, I think it's it's. Uh, Quite amazing the way that Maxim plays because uh, most other players play several different systems and he just he sticks to one system and um, I mean he, he does quite well so uh, it certainly works for him. Uh, one more question: Your thoughts on your game tomorrow against uh, Wesley? Both of you at fifty percent. Uh, both of you also have a pretty similar score against each other. He's only got one game on you in classical, but ten draws. It looks like uh, you guys pretty evenly match whenever you play. Yeah, uh, I actually didn't know I was playing Wesley tomorrow, um, so it's, uh, that's uh, good to know. Um, yeah, I mean, Wesley, Wesley, of course, has been playing quite well over the last year or so, um, and, and, and so obviously it'll be an interesting game. Um, just, just try and play good chess is, is really all that I'm going to do. All right, well, thank you very much, and good luck in the rest of the tournament. Sure. Thank you, Maurice. Well, you might have to call uh, the night off the French from now on, because uh, this Frenchman seems to play it uh, with great elan and confidence and certainty and plays it simply all the time. Uh, today you got a position with the move queen to c7. We saw you in the confessional booth saying uh, you like this move queen c7 over rook to b8. It seemed like you had no problems on the opening. Yeah, actually, uh, I thought the question was whether I had some chance to go for something more dynamic at some point. And there are a couple of positions where I can just do that, but uh, it doesn't seem to make sound, so uh, I was maybe a bit lazy also. Uh, I was not calculating lines as deeply as I should, and uh, just uh, was a little bit too up here about my position and uh, let it go, um, you know, get a very solid position where where actually only I can be in some trouble. But uh, in any case, I mean, uh, after the game, uh, we saw that, I mean, any of my attempts is pr probably misguided. So, I mean, all in all, it's uh, not like I missed something, but I still sh probably should have used more time in the opening. Tell me, Hikaru made a point that most other players try to play a couple of other things and surprise people in the opening. But you would just stick to the night orf. It's like, this is your bread and butter, and you tell them, come hell or high water, come try to break me in this night orf. Uh, that seems like it's been a conscious effort in your part. You don't play anything else. 
Yeah, I've not played anything else in a w for a while. I uh, played the Karakan at some point. Um, I can't even see you in a Karakan. <laughs> 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 I did, I really did. And some other Sicilians, of course, but um, I even play for, uh, played E4 in E5, I think, uh, one time. I mean, in a classical game, so. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, I feel so confident in these kind of positions, and uh, of course, there's some risk of getting out prepared, and this is what happened to me. Uh, uh, a few times uh, this last year against these guys, but uh, somehow, you know, I consolidated uh, a bit these things. I tried to, to be more focused, and then, you know, I'm confident that I can answer any question uh, uh, over the board because, uh, well, I mean, I have quite a deal of experience, of course, in these positions, and uh, I know also where to look for the dynamics. I mean, there's, of course, still a lot uh, that I can can improve in this opening because I, far from playing it perfectly, but uh, I mean this is a kind of uh, position nobody plays perfectly. You play Peter Spittler tomorrow. Well, what can we expect from you in that game? Well, I mean, of course, uh, anytime I'm white, I'm gonna want to press and. Uh, well, I mean, I don't even know myself what I will play tomorrow, <laughs> so I don't know if I, if I will try to find something sharp or if I will just uh, go the way I, more or less I went against Wesley, trying to, to put pressure and to, to play solid, so uh, we'll see. I mean, there's, uh, you know, a lot depends on my mood tomorrow and also on Peter, Peter's mood because uh, he doesn't... Uh, shy away from complications from time to time. You just said something that fascinates me. Uh, at this level, you know who you're going to play in this tournament. You knew before the tournament started. You knew you could only have either white or have black. Didn't you prepare beforehand specifically, like, I know I'm going to play Peter Spiddler eventually, so I'm going to have either white or black, and if this happens, if I get white, I'm going to play this. Of course, the drawing of the lots determines exactly what you play. Uh, so before the tournament, you prepared both colors against everyone? I mean, ideally, sh that should be the case. And, uh, well, actually, I mean, also I know Peter quite well. I know what he plays because I've played uh, him and uh, every other player out here at least uh, a dozen times and probably even more. But um, at the same time, uh, you know, first of all, they can prepare some surprise. Uh, specifically for this tournament. I mean, not really Peter, but uh, sometimes this happens. Uh, there can be, um, uh, I mean, some very good idea launched by another player in an earlier round, uh, which changes uh, everything. And, you know, I mean, it's a lot of energy for something that's, you know, only hypothetical, I think. So how many hours would we expect you to prepare Per, per game, and once you now know the pairings, uh, you know you have white against them. How long do you will we expect you to prepare? Will it be tonight and tomorrow, or like how do you do that? Well, first of all, I mean uh, I'm not the only one, of course, preparing for my games, and uh, I'm probably not the one, uh, um, you know, working the most on this game because I mean I I need to refresh my memory, of course, before the game and. Uh, I mean, I need, of course, to give some directions and uh, everything, but, uh, yeah, I mean, most of the uh, ungrateful work uh, looking at lines with computer, I actually don't do because uh, it's a lot of energy and... Uh, so you think your second does it for you? Yes, basically. And also the thing is, when you look at the computer, uh, too much. Somehow your brain adjusts and um, then during the game you don't think by yourself as clearly as you should. Your, your shots are a bit uh, polluted with the computer and I mean even in the positions you looked at, uh, somehow it's good also to have a fresh, a fresh eye and not just think about the computer lines. Very fascinating stuff. Mind and laboratory of a top grandmaster. Thank you very much for sharing those thoughts and good luck in your preparations for tomorrow. Thank you, Morris. Thank you, to Maxine and Stan Jennifer. Yeah, I love that interview. I really learned something there about uh, not polluting your brain with computer lines right before.